Good morning to everyone. It is good to be here and good to see all that have been able to make it out for our Lord's Day assembly. We have a wonderful crowd and we are so thankful for everyone's presence. And as you can see today on the board, what we're going to be talking about is leadership. A couple of months ago, I gave a sermon on leadership focusing on the Christian's responsibility, our responsibility as individual Christians towards leadership. And I mentioned back then that this year, part of what I, what I want to do, along with some of the other series and some of the other themes that I'll be teaching on, is I want to teach a little bit more on leadership. And so I hope to do that. This is the second sermon this year that I'll be giving in this vein. And Lord willing, if not once a month, probably at least every other month from this point through the rest of the year and maybe into early next year, I hope to continue to teach about various aspects of leadership because I think it is a very important thing in the New Testament. It's something that we as God's people and as God's church should take very seriously and soberly and something that we should be pursuing. And so today what I want to talk about is simply the pattern that the New Testament gives us concerning leadership in the Lord's church. Now, as the church of Christ, as Christians that claim to be following the New Testament, we take the idea of patterns very seriously. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul exhorted Timothy, he said, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. It's important as preachers that we learn and follow the pattern and teach the pattern. It's important as teachers that we do the exact same thing. It's important as Christians that we are people who want to learn and understand and follow the pattern that God has given us. Now, what is a pattern? I think we know what a pattern is. A pattern is something that allows us to reproduce something. If you were to take a set of blueprints as a builder, you could look at those blueprints, and it provides a pattern. And as you look at that pattern, you can build a house just the way that the architect and the engineer and the homeowner want it to be built. And if you want to build another house just like that, you can. How? By referring back to the same pattern. If you're a dressmaker or a seamstress, what do you use to make many of those clothes? You use a pattern. And tailors can use a pattern and reproduce again and again and again the same item of clothing, the same sizes even, same patterns. That's what a pattern is for. It allows something to be reproduced. And in the New Testament, spiritually speaking, Patterns, the patterns that God has given us, allow us to reproduce and do the same thing that God instructed to the very first Christians. You see, that's why a pattern is important. Because we look back and we think we've been separated from the early church by 2,000 years. How can we be the same church as the first century? How can we worship the way that the first Christians did? How can we be saved the same way they were saved? Well, because God has given us patterns. He has given us His Word, and if we'll follow that Word and that pattern, then we can be simply Christians, just like the very first converts that we read about in the New Testament. In fact, this idea of a pattern was instrumental in the 1800s movement that we know as the Restoration. When men like Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, and not just them, but many others, began to go back to just the Bible. They wanted to throw off the creeds and the philosophies and the traditions of men, and so they wanted to find the pattern in the New Testament. We often talk about restoring New Testament Christianity, and when we talk about restoring New Testament Christianity, what we're talking about is going back to the pattern of the Bible. And again, we take these very seriously. For example, when it comes to salvation, we teach the pattern of the New Testament. Why is it that we don't teach people that in order to be saved, what they need to do is accept Jesus in their heart and say a sinner's prayer? You hear that all over the place. Why don't we teach that? Because that's not what the Bible teaches. Because that's not the pattern that is found in the New Testament. The pattern that's found in the New Testament is that a sinner hears the gospel preached. They hear the good news about Jesus Christ and His death and His burial and His resurrection. And hearing that, they believe it. And believing that Christ is the Son of God and has died for their sins, they repent of their sins, they confess Jesus, and they're baptized for the remission of their sins. And then they live faithfully to the Lord. Why do we teach that? Because we think that's the best idea? Because that's what we like? No, because that's the pattern that the New Testament gives. We follow a pattern when it comes to worship. Why is it that here in a few moments when we observe the Lord's Supper, we'll do so with one cup and with one loaf? Is it because we're weird? 
Is it because we're backwards? Is it because we just really like the possibility of germs? No, it's because this is the pattern. Because this is what God has given us. Why is it we don't have musical instruments? Because God has told us in His Word how He wants us to praise Him in song. By making singing and making melody in our hearts. Why is it that only the men teach? Because that's the pattern. Why do we get together on every Sunday? Not just once every quarter or once a year or just whenever we want to. Because this is the pattern. We all take these things seriously. I think everyone in this room, especially everyone that's a, that's a baptized member, believes in these patterns. And we would defend these patterns seriously. And we should. But here's the question. In our quest to restore New Testament Christianity, while we have focused on worship, and we have focused on the doctrine and the plan of salvation, the question is, have we restored New Testament leadership? Ironically, one of, the major, one of the first major departures, one of the earliest departures from the faith that ultimately ended up leading to Catholicism and from there to all of the denominationalism that you see had to do with an apostasy concerning leadership. Instead of men abiding by the leadership given in the New Testament, men began to be over, you had bishops over a set of elders and then bishops over an area of elders and then you had this hierarchy that ended up leading to the Catholic Church. That was one of the first greatest apostasies. And from that, of course, over time, the doctrines of salvation and worship and all sorts of other patterns are tainted. But as we restored, as New Testament Christianity was restored in places like America and England where the restoration movements took place and other places throughout the world that we probably don't even know about, at least here, we have focused on some of these things, but I fear that the New Testament pattern of leadership has not always been of paramount importance. And I think that's clear because when you look at the church today, throughout our country, you don't see a lot of churches that are really images, perfectly in leadership, of what the New Testament has called us to be. I believe that the New Testament pattern for congregational leadership is that every congregation is to be led by a group of recognized, qualified, and appointed elders. Now, I think we've all heard about elders. We've taught about elders. We read of them a little bit. But the truth is, throughout this country, I'm not just talking about here, throughout our brotherhood in this country, if I'm correct, I believe that a vast majority of our congregations do not have elders. Many of them have not held elders in some time, if they have ever had elders. And there may be various reasons for this. This is not meant to make us feel bad because we've never had elders. But it's meant to highlight the point that we have grown accustomed to a pattern that is not the New Testament pattern. Now, we'll mention, and, and I believe it is possible for a congregation to exist without elders, but that is not the ideal, and it is not the pattern as God's Word shows us. And so that's the point I want to make today is the pattern for New Testament leadership in God's church is for there to be elders in a congregation. And what we're, and we're going to look at the New Testament. You know, am I just making that up? Is that just something that I'm saying because I think we should have elders? Or is that the New Testament plan? Is that the pattern? Well, let's look at that today. Let's look at the early church, the New Testament church and the pattern. And what we see there is, first of all, as we read through the New Testament, we see that elders are present. In fact, from very early on, we see elders present in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 11, verse 29, we're told about Paul and Barnabas. They've been up in Antioch, uh, and they are sent, they've heard about a great need in Judea. And in Jerusalem, there's a famine, and so there is a relief effort taking place. And Paul and Barnabas are sent uh, by Antioch. And where do they go? They go to Jerusalem to deliver this, and it says that they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. As far as I can tell, this is the first mention in the New Testament of church elders. You read about some of the Jewish elders in the Gospels, but this is the first mention of elders in the New Testament church. Now, we aren't told when these elders were established. We're not told when they are appointed. We see the beginning of the church in Acts 2. The apostles are there in Jerusalem, and they are leading the church. But then by Acts 11, we have 
elders. Now again, were they appointed within the first six months of the church's existence? Within the first year? I don't know. But by the point of Acts 11, I don't know the exact chronology, but you're probably within 15 to 20 years, maybe 30 at the most, but I think that's on the far end, probably within 15 years of the beginning of the church. Within 15 years of the church at Jerusalem starting, they had established elders that Paul and Barnabas were sent to. And they're an important part in the leadership structure of the church in Jerusalem. We see the elders of Jerusalem again in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is a chapter you can go and read for yourself sometime. What has happened is there have been some men come from Jerusalem. They claim that they have the authority of the leaders in Jerusalem, but they've come up to Antioch where Paul has been. Antioch is a mixture of Jewish background Christians and Gentile background Christians. And these teachers from Jerusalem have come up and they're teaching that for these Gentiles to really be saved, not only must they believe and obey Christ, but they must obey the law of Moses, or at least parts of it. They must be circumcised. Well, as we see in Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas, uh, there's no small dissension. They debate this with these teachers vigorously because this is a false gospel. We're going to be talking about a lot of that in Galatians. Very similar message. Well, the leaders at Antioch decide what to do is we need, these men say they come from Jerusalem. We need to send them back to Jerusalem with Paul and Barnabas and some of our men so that they can go figure this out. Now, who did they send them to? They go back and they go to the apostles and to the elders. Notice by this point, the apostles are still, they're an important part of the leadership, but the elders in Acts 15, you can read through Acts 15 and see that the elders are mentioned with the apostles throughout the entire book there, or throughout the entire chapter there. The elders were present in Jerusalem, and their function was known and recognized by Antioch. The idea of elders was a common understanding amongst the early church. And elders played a crucial role in determining the truth about doctrinal issues. It's interesting that they didn't just go to the apostles. Surely the apostles had the authority to settle this. But this was a congregational matter. The apostles would not always be with the church in person. Their doctrine would live on through the New Testament. But the elders played a role in leading the church. One final verse in Jerusalem uh, in Acts 21. This is... Uh, Paul has returned. This is some years later. Paul returns again to Jerusalem and he meets with James uh, and all the elders, we're told, were present. And again, you can read that about the situation there and the efforts that the elders tried to engage in to bring about some peace because of problems that were plaguing the church in that area. But the key point here is we see from fairly early on throughout all the existence of the church in Jerusalem that we read about, Who is there? Elders. On the earliest days, it was likely just the apostles, but apparently before too long, they had developed and appointed men to be elders to lead the congregation. Now, not only do we see elders present in Jerusalem, but we see elders present in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem and as he goes, he, he goes, uh, it says, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. We're going to come back to these verses in a little while, uh, later on to see some of the purpose of the elders or the need for elders. Right now, I just want to point out that it's very clear that Ephesus had elders. When, in Acts chapter 20, again, we might not know the exact time frame, but it couldn't have been more than a few years after the church at Ephesus had begun. This isn't 50 years, 100 years later. This is a few years after Ephesus has been established. They have elders. Elders who Paul loves and trusts and who Paul calls to him to give them some warnings and some exhortations about the great need and responsi- for them and the responsibility that they carry as elders. Now, something else that I want to point out here in Acts chapter 20 Paul says to them, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Why were there elders in Ephesus? Was it because eldership was some, there were elders in Judaism and Paul was a Jew from background and so he thought that was a good idea and so when Paul went to churches, he appointed elders and he just borrowed that from Judaism because that seemed like a good leadership structure? No. Paul established elders in churches because that was what the Holy Spirit told him to do. Because it was the will of the Holy Spirit that God's church be led by elders. 
And that's what we have in the New Testament. As you have qualifications, now that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit specifically picks out individuals in this congregation, and we have to figure out who the Holy Spirit has picked out. The Holy Spirit has provided us through the pattern of the New Testament who are to be the elders, who are to be qualified, how they are qualified. And it's up to us to recognize that, to work towards that, recognize that, and obey and follow that pattern. Eldership is not a man-made idea of leadership. It is a divinely mandated role and uh, a role of leadership. Another congregation that we see is Lystra, possibly Derby. Uh, and Lystra, and Ter- this is where Timothy is from. You can go back and read, and we'll see some of this in just a moment. But Lystra was one of the congregations that Paul established on his first missionary journey. And this is where Timothy was from. And in 1 Timothy 4.14 Paul reminds Timothy, this is a little later in his life, but he says, Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Almost all commentators I've read after have agreed that the laying of hands, laying on of hands that Paul is talking about is when Paul went back through on his second missionary journey to these churches. And there we're, we're told, you can go back and read, uh, I believe, Uh, Acts 16 about this. We'll see some of this in a little bit. But Timothy had matured in the faith. He was well spoken of by all the congregations. And Paul wanted to take him with him throughout the rest of his missionary journey. And the congregation agreed to that. And that is almost certainly when he had the elders lay their hands on him. What is that? They are appointing him. They are setting him apart to the service and work of an evangelist. They're setting him apart to the work that Paul is going to do in preaching the gospel. We could talk all about that and the other situations, but the point here is there were elders. There were elders present, and they were in charge. They were responsible for seeing that the preaching of the gospel continued and appointing qualified men to do just this. And elders play a role in selecting and appointing and training men to be able to preach the gospel. Another one we see at the congregation at Philippi, that there were elders. We don't, learn a whole, we don't learn about when or how or how many, but we're just simply told in Philippians 1 verse 1, when Paul begins that letter, it is written to the, to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers, those are elders, that's another term for elders, and the deacons. And we don't know a lot of details, we just know that Philippi follows the pattern of the other churches that we've seen. They have elders. Again, here... We don't know exactly when this book was written, but most commentators I've seen estimate that Philippians was written within or around 11 years after Paul had first founded the congregation. Within the time period of roughly a decade, elders had already been developed and appointed and were leading the congregation. Now, what we've seen in all these cases is that elders were present and fairly early on. One thing we might say, and I've said this in the past, One of the reasons that the church may have been able to develop elders so quickly was probably twofold. One, many of the converts were Jewish converts who had grown up in the religion that pointed forward to Christianity. And so if you were a faithful and a devout Jew who had been familiar with the Scriptures, while it would be a big change to go to Christianity, it would be a leap and a change that actually the Old Testament pointed to. And so there may have been an element of maturity and wisdom and knowledge of the Scriptures that might not be present in someone who's never ever heard of the God of Israel or the church. So that's a possible explanation. And yet some of these churches that we're reading about have heavy Gentile presence and they still have elders. The other thing that we might mention is there, of course, are miraculous gifts. Paul seems when he had gone to congregations, usually as an apostle, he had the ability and so he would impart spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts, gifts of prophecy and tongues and other things like you can read about in 1 Corinthians. So we might assume, well, perhaps these spiritual gifts allowed men to become elders quicker. Uh, Perhaps that's true. That might be true, but you go read 1 Corinthians. Spiritual gifts didn't keep those men from doing things that were wrong. And so we, better, we should probably be careful about assuming that it just made men incredibly better and in, on the fast track to eldership. So we have to go back to why did it take them 10 years or less? And most times in congregations in our brotherhood, it takes 50 or 100 years and we still have never developed elders. That's the question. And I'm not here to point fingers. I've never been a part of a congregation that had elders. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about all over our brotherhood in some cases. 
Maybe it's, again, we haven't focused on the pattern quite as much as we ought to have. Well, not, why were elders so present? Well, one of the reasons the elders were present is because elders were pursued. It was the active goal and effort of Paul and others to appoint elders. We mentioned Lystra, and we'll look at Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. That's Antioch, Pisidia. This is part of Paul's first preaching tour, his first missionary journey, where he goes through the, uh, the area of southern Galatia. We talked a little bit about that in our Galatians introduction. But as he has gone through this whole area, he gets down to Derby, and when he's done preaching in Derby, that's where it says that when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, Paul and Barnabas return to all of the congregations that they have visited and established so far on their first missionary journey. And it says that they returned, they were strengthening the souls of the disciples, they encouraged them to continue in the faith, they reminded them of the tribulations that they would face, but then it says, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And we might not know the exact time frame, but from the time that Paul established the first, the, these congregations on his trip through southern Galatia, and then he gets to Derby and he preaches and he begins traveling back through Europe months since the beginning of these churches. Maybe a year or more, I, I don't know the exact chronology, but again, it's not a real long time. And yet even in that time frame, Paul goes back and he recognizes there are men that are devout, there are men that are qualified at this point in time, and they are thus needed. These fledgling congregations need leadership. Now Paul's role as an apostle, sp speaking the gospel and taking it to unknown places, to the Gentiles, is not to just stay at, e at one congregation and lead that congregation. That would have been a blessing for that congregation. But that wasn't his role. He was to go and continue to preach. But they needed leadership. They needed men who would stand for the truth. Would these be perfect men? No. That's why you have many of the New Testament letters. Because even churches that had elders still needed encouragement and exhortation and admonition. But these were men that loved the Lord. And they were proving faithful. And so Paul entrusted with them the flock of God as the elders of those congregations. Now again, I don't think this is an accident. I think this is Paul's plan. Paul's plan was to start a congregation, build it up as he could, and then when it was time to depart, if there were men that were qualified to be elders, he appointed them as elders. This is the pattern that Paul is following. Not just one-offs that Paul follows here and there. Oh, there's finally some men to be elders. This is okay, but really it's not a big deal if there aren't elders. And I think we see that because we see that this was the goal on the island of Crete. When writing to Titus, Paul says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now, this is where I want to make the point, and I've already mentioned this. What we see is Paul established congregations in southern Galatia. Paul has established congregations, or others have established congregations in Crete. They are scriptural congregations. They are existing, and they don't have elders. It is possible. I'm not saying that it is sinful for a congregation to not have elders. It is possible for a congregation to not have elders. But is that the ideal? Is that the pattern? is that the long-term goal of a congregation's well-being to continue without elders? No. See, it's much like a Christian's growth. Just as a Christian might obey the gospel, and does, or a person obey the gospel, and we call them a babe in Christ, and there is a maturing process, congregations are the same way. Congregations might be begun, and they're immature. That's not a knock against people. That's not a slight against people. I've seen this, you know, in overseas work, you get to see this some. Sometimes you go into a place, like we had the wonderful blessing of doing last year on Zanzibar, and you meet some people, and they are hungry for the truth, and you preach the gospel to them, and they obey the gospel, and you work as hard as you can with them to establish, to teach them what you can, but they're young in the faith, and there's some growing to do. But as a part of that growing process, what marks maturity? Well, a mature congregation is one that has scripturally ordained leadership. Elders and deacons, as we see at Philippi, leadership according to the pattern 
if a congregation continues and continues and continues without scriptural leadership and without a plan to work towards scriptural leadership, at what point are they just simply persisting and content with their immaturity? Again, I don't want to say it's sinful to not have elders, but it's dangerous to get to a point where we're comfortable and content without elders. Paul saw fit to put one of his greatest workers, Titus, instead of working with him and in other places that Titus could be used, to send Titus to Crete to go to every town where there was a church and work to set in order what was lacking. What was lacking? Part of it was they hadn't had established any elders yet. And that's what we have to recognize. It's not a slight, it's not a knock against us, but until we have God-approved eldership, there is something lacking. There is something to work towards. There is something to desire. And there is still growth and maturity to take place. Again, we see that even when elders are present, elders are continuously pursued. When Paul wrote the letter to 1 Timothy, Timothy was in Ephesus. I believe that while Timothy was in Ephesus, there were already elders. Because Paul talks about how you work with and treat elders and support elders. There were elders already in Ephesus. And yet, still, Paul writes to Timothy and gives him in 1 Timothy 3 the qualifications for elders. Why? Because once we get to a point where we have elders, have we arrived and thus we're content? No. You see, because those elders won't always be here. There's another generation coming up. And they need to be taught. And they need to be prepared. And leaders need to be trained and rise through those generations So that when this generation of leaders passes away, the church is not all of a sudden back to an infant state, but has men who are ready and prepared to take up the mantle of leadership and continue to shepherd God's flock. So it's a perpetual thing of training for elders and of men training to become elders. And the reason that elders were pursued and the elders were present is simply put because elders were prescribed. Because elders were deemed the pattern that God had for His church. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Speaking of Christ, it says that He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Shepherds is another term, another way of speaking about elders. Now we still have the apostles and prophets with us today through the New Testament. They provided us the doctrine as inspired men from Christ that governs the church. So we don't have apostles and prophets living with us, but we still abide by the doctrine of the apostles and prophets. But even though we have the doctrine of the apostles and prophets, we still need leaders. And God said the leaders of the church, those who are to oversee the various aspects of the flock, are evangelists and elders and teachers. Now they all have similar roles and yet different goals. And so this is part of how can a congregation exist without elders? Well, there have to be teachers. There have to be. I don't see how a congregation can really exist without teachers because then you have nothing that God has prescribed. And so there's teachers, but teachers grow and mature. And Lord willing, at a point, they become elders, overseers, shepherds that are there to guide by example and by service and by sound, faithful teaching the flock of God. Again, this is not my idea. This is not Paul's idea. Eldership and church leadership as a whole is a gift. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 4 verse 11. It is a gift from Christ. It is prescribed by Christ. Also, we see in James 5 14 the need for elders. Now, over there, James says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, the meaning of this passage is highly debated. There's a lot of people that uh, have different opinions, and you can go read the commentaries or talk to different people. People wonder, you know, is this speaking about physical sickness? Is this speaking about spiritual sickness? What does it mean that the elders are to anoint them with oil? Is that just elders are to do medically what's best back then, and really that's been replaced? Is that something else? And all those details can be studied and should be studied and debated and discussed. But here's what's very simple. Whatever the sickness was, spiritual or physical, and whatever the anointing was, the command is still the same. 
Is anyone sick? Call for the elders. And if you want to say that spiritual sickness, then when someone recognizes they're spiritually sick and they need help, what should they do? James says, you call the elders. Is someone in dire situations with physical sickness, if that's what that means, what should they do? James's instruction is, you call for the elders. What's this teach us? James assumed that the groups that he was writing to were in congregations that had elders. It would make little sense if elders were the exception and not the rule. For James to say, well, call for the elders. Only one out of 50 congregations might have them. The rest of you are out of luck. Now, I know what comes up here is we ask questions like, well, what do we do in a congregation that doesn't have elders? You know, who makes the decisions when elders aren't present? Who oversees church discipline when elders aren't present? Who is called in these circumstances when elders aren't present? Those are legitimate questions. I, w those are, because that situation has and can arise. But the problem is, sometimes that's all we focus on. As we read something like James 5.14, let them call for the elders, and our first thought is, well, there are no elders, so what does that mean for us? Instead of thinking, of, well, this means that we should be working pretty diligently towards elders. We get so worried about the exception and focus on that and justify the exception instead of first and primarily devoting ourselves to following the rule and the pattern. And the exception might be important. We have to come up with those answers too. But don't come up with those answers and then justify never working towards eldership. Obviously, James considered eldership to be quite needed. We already referenced Acts chapter 20 and verse 17 when Paul calls the elders from Ephesus. But he says to them there, well, the reason he has called them there is he says, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Elders are needed. Church leaders are needed because in every age of the church's existence, it has faced false teachers and false doctrine. From the earliest years of Christianity to almost 2,000 years later in 2019, and every year in between, there have been false teachers and false doctrines that the church has had to defend itself against. Now, is it the role and the responsibility of every single one of us to learn the truth, know the truth, and defend the truth? Yes, emphatically. But there's a special responsibility and a special need for established, qualified, spiritually-minded men that guide that process. Why? Is it because most people just aren't able to? That's not the reason. As I said, we're all at different points. There are people that are new to Christ, that are babes in Christ, and they are not yet equipped to face the dangers of false doctrine on their own. Do you send a newborn baby or even a toddler or even a kid that's seven or eight out to the world to make it for themselves? No. That's foolishness. Why would we do that spiritually? You see, children need guardians. They need people to help them. In the church, God has set in place a pattern whereby those who have proven through faithful service to love the Lord, to love His Word, to study it and to apply it to their lives, doesn't mean they're perfect, but they have proven to be worthy of following, worthy of listening to, and we always study what they say and apply and prove it with Scripture. But they've proven faithful so we can rely on them. We need men like that to teach us, to build us up, to edify us, and to help protect us against false doctrine. In fact, Paul tells that to Titus. In, first, or in Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, Paul begins his letter to Titus. Remember, he's there to appoint elders in every city. So Paul gives him the qualifications of the elders. And the thing that immediately follows in verses 10 and 11 is, For there are many insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. Why were elders so necessary on Crete? Because there were false teachers. And these congregations on Crete needed to be protected against false doctrine. And Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, verse 14 and 15. 
I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Now, some people think perhaps this is what Paul is saying this about what he's getting ready to say in chapters 4 on. But these words come right after chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, which guess what those verses are? They are the qualifications for elders and deacons. In chapter 2, Paul talks broadly about the roles of men and women. In chapter 3, he gives the qualifications of church leadership and elders and the servants of the church, the deacons. And then he says, I'm planning to come to you soon, but in case I'm delayed, the reason I've written these things and the reason I'm writing the things that are to come is so that you may know how you all ought to behave in the household of God. The church is the household of God. But only when it is abiding by the pattern that God has provided. And part of that pattern of being built up as the household of God is following the New Testament plan of leadership. So a question, we're out of time. Just a few minutes, I want to ask the question, how do we work towards an eldership? I, ho- I, I don't give this to make us feel guilty. Like I said, I've been, I've been a part of multiple congregations in my life, and never once have I been in a congregation that has had eldership. I'm not saying this to get us down or make us feel bad. I'm teaching these things to encourage us to, to seek, to follow the New Testament pattern. Like I said, can a congregation exist without elders? Yes. Are we a faithful congregation? I believe we are. But we have to recognize as a congregation that even our situation right now is not ideal. And it should not be perpetual. Instead, we need to determine that we want to follow the pattern. Now, may that take time to develop and establish biblical elders? Yes. How long will that take? I don't know. Could it happen in a year? Maybe. Could it happen? Will it take five years? Ten years? Fifteen years? I don't know. I don't have that answer yet. I don't know if any of us do. But here's what I do know. What I believe with all my heart. That process has to begin now. It has to begin right now. A few of us were talking uh, just recently about eldership. You know, it's easy to look at the situation And we wonder, well, why haven't we developed eldership? Why here and across our brotherhood, why are there congregations that have been in existence for decades and there are no elders? I don't know. And it does no no good to point fingers and say, well, it's this person's fault or this idea's thought. Don't know. Can't change it. What does matter is that we change it now. And even if we don't all get to see the fruits of our labor, if we begin now working towards and preparing for and seeking after biblical leadership, one day I believe full-heartedly that it will happen. And generations to come can rise up and grow up with New Testament leadership. What a wonderful thing that would be, but how do we do it? Do we just say, well, we want elders one day? Well, there's a few things that I'd like to suggest. First of all, we need as a congregation to agree that this is what we want. This can't be what I want. can't be just what a few teachers want. This, as a congregation, is something that we must agree that we want to be organized and led in accordance with God's New Testament pattern. Thus, if we can agree on that, we need to teach on the biblical pattern. That's part of why I want to do this teaching. Why I plan to teach not just this sermon, but more sermons. And I hope that uh, maybe other teachers can study some of these things and teach these so that we can teach on the biblical pattern, the roles, the qualifications of leaders so that we can grow. In conjunction with teaching, we all need to commit to learning this. We all, you know, do we know the qualifications of elders? Maybe not because we haven't taught on it, but have we studied it individually? Have you studied? If not, I'm not saying that to make you feel guilty. I'm saying this to encourage you as we go through this over the next few months. I want everyone to get engaged in learning and studying further the roles and understanding the roles of members, the roles of leaders, the qualifications of elders, and the purpose of elders. We all need to be a part of this. Something especially to the men. 
We need men of all ages who are committed to spiritual maturity. Whether you think you will be an elder or not, whether you have the desire to be an elder or not, whether you can or cannot be qualified, we need men who are committed to spiritual maturity. That is the only way we will ever develop elders. And for those of us that are younger, for those of us that are in our 20s and our 30s, men, the road to eldership starts today if it hasn't started already. Are we 10 and 20 and maybe 30 years away from eldership? Possibly. But don't wait 10 or 20 or 30 years because then you'll be an older man and not qualified. Start today. And for all of us, we need to encourage men. We need to encourage men to grow and develop as godly leaders. Not make people feel bad, but encourage them. Exhort them. When we see men that have the ability to be good godly leaders, encourage that because we need them. And together, we all need to pray. I hope that this is something that you'll pray for. It's something that I hope and plan to pray for. Pray for our congregation. Pray for the men that lead this congregation. Pray for the future of this congregation. Pray that we may be able to develop and seek out and establish qualified godly men to be elders. We can put all of the effort we want in the world into this endeavor. But we want to do this according to God's way. We seek His blessings. We seek His guidance through His Word. And so if nothing else... I hope that we will pray for this end. Well, I hope that the sermon this morning has been helpful. It's time to draw it to a close. But I hope it has encouraged all of us to think soberly and seriously about the New Testament pattern of the Lord's church and its leadership. As we draw the sermon to a close, we extend the gospel invitation to those who are here. Perhaps there's someone who has not obeyed the gospel pattern that Jesus, through His Word, has given to us. We mentioned that briefly, but we'll mention it again. If you've not obeyed the gospel, you have that opportunity to do so today. Many men will tell you different ideas, but the pattern, what the New Testament lays out, is that if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that He has died for your sins, and if that belief has moved you to be willing and ready to repent of your sins and your life of worldliness, if you're ready to confess Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, then what you need to do is be baptized. Baptized in water for the remission of your sins so that the blood of Christ can cleanse you and so that you can be added to His family, so that you can be added to His church, so that you can be forgiven of your sins. And from that point, begin to live faithful. Will you be a babe in Christ? Yes, you will. But you have a whole family here who will encourage and work with you and exhort you and help you as you seek to live faithfully in service to the Lord. And if you're here today and there's, you're a Christian but there's some sin in your life, change that. Repent, pray to God and ask for His forgiveness or come forward confessing your faults and we would be happy to pray with you and for you. Or if you just have requests for prayer, we'd be happy to pray on your behalf. If there be someone in need, we'd invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.